get us started by giving us a broad context about the teacher shortages that are going on in different places around the country and how those shortages have an intersection with federal policy and what are the risks and opportunities here? I've sort of said, you know, is it a perfect storm or a perfect opportunity? And I think it's a little bit of both, like most things. When there is a crisis that comes forward, it sometimes really challenges us in really creative and productive ways, or it also really discourages us and helps us just do whatever we can to get through it. So I think there's a little bit of both going on here. So we're going to look at the overview of the teacher shortages. What is that looking like? These different definitions of teacher quality, that's something that really has been deferred to the states since NCLB has gone by the wayside and we now have ESSA. The many, many multiple ways that people now can become teachers and how the changes in federal policy intersect there. Most of this information I'm presenting is from research done by the Learning Policy Institute. They predicted that it would be rising to 112,000 by 2017. I don't know exactly what it is now. And I think that notion of defining what is a teacher shortage is another really interesting topic. In my view, a shortage is when you don't have a fully qualified person in front of the kids. But in some places, if you have an emergency certified teacher or if you have someone who has come in through some lateral entry and still learning how to be a teacher, that doesn't count for the shortage. So definition can be challenging as well. One way to look at it is the number of emergency certified teachers, which generally is an indicator that they're not really ready Special education has persistently been the field with the greatest shortage, 48 states report it. Others, of course, are STEM foreign languages and teaching English learners. This is not a equitable distribution of challenge. Our highest poverty schools experience both the greatest teacher shortage and one reason for that is a greater turnover among teachers. So you're getting a bit of a rotating, inexperienced teachers come in, they're overwhelmed, and they leave. So there's a cycle that goes on with some of our neediest kids. The other thing is that the pipeline doesn't look great. Enrollment in teacher prep programs is down 35% in the last five years. It's down for both alternate routes and traditional schools of education. We do know that teachers who are prepared through alternate works with less coursework and less clinical preparation, the quick fix kind of programs are 25% more likely to leave their schools and the profession than those who are well prepared. So preparation makes a difference in terms of teacher turnover. And we know that teacher turnover has a negative effect on student achievement. So these are all interrelated and quite complex when you go to try to intervene. Teachers of color leave schools and the profession at a higher rate than white teachers, exacerbating the disconnect we have between the demographics of our school population and the demographics of our teacher workforce. Teacher shortage replacement costs are about $8 billion a year. So this is not a challenge without cost, just to bringing someone new in, to onboarding them, to getting them up to speed, and then they leave and you start all over again. There is definitely a cost to that. How does federal policy intersect with this? You know, at the same time that the shortage really bubbled up in a very significant way, ESSA came to pass. There are some very big changes in ESSA from NCLB in terms of teacher quality. The first is that this term highly qualified is gone and it's eliminated. It doesn't exist in any federal law anymore. They amended the Higher Ed Act, IDEA, anywhere the term teach grants, anywhere the term highly qualified appeared, it's now gone. Highly qualified certainly was a term with some contention, but what it did require is a certain level of content knowledge, a bachelor's degree, full state certification, which could be achieved through an alternate route, but only during a three-year period with supervision and professional development leading to full certification. In other words, if you were in an alternate route, you could only be there for three years and you had to have this support and a program that was gonna result in you having full certification after the three years. 
So all of that is gone in ESSA. So what the feds are now saying to the states is it's all about state certification. You decide what state certification means, you set the bar and whatever you say goes. So that is both a risk and an opportunity when states are threatened with some pretty serious shortages and when there is an opportunity to significantly lower standards to get bodies into classrooms, that can certainly be a way to go. Understandably, you gotta open schools, so you need a person there. This was an NCLB, and I think it's something that at least has been on the books for a long time. And this is a requirement that states look at the inequity of teacher credentials, experience, et cetera, in terms of the impact on different student populations. So the states are required to determine if high need schools are inequitably staffed in comparison to other schools by teachers in terms of their experience, their effectiveness, their out of field placements, those three variables. The states define all these terms and they must have plans to address this situation if they determine that it occurs. I was really hopeful that we would be able to get from the ESSA state plan submitted to the department a full picture of how are states differing in defining experience. Is it one year? Is it three years? Is it five years? Is it six months? But many states did not report how they are defining it. They're required by law to define it, but they're not required by law to tell people exactly what their determination is. Some states have included it, some haven't. The same is true for effectiveness. What does that mean? In some states, it's very much tied to the teacher evaluation plans. In others, it's tied to preparation. That, again, varies. Same with out-of-field placement. That seems like it would be the most straightforward if you're not certified in the area that you're teaching in. That would seem to be an out-of-field placement, but the way some states are looking at certification, sometimes it's hard to tell. There's a lot of discretion, a lot of sort of messiness here, and a lot of opportunity also for states to really take a look at this and decide how they're going to move forward. As I said, this has been on the books for a long time, and there's not a great track record of robust planning and implementation. States tend to make their plans and it's hard to tell what happens afterwards. And it's not an easy thing sometimes, you know, to try to figure out how to get your most experienced teachers in your highest need schools. There's a lot of challenges along the way on that path. IDEA is different from ESSA. They amended when they changed NCLB to ESSA. As I said, they eliminated the term highly qualified. That also used to be an IDEA that is gone in IDEA now as well. But what the law says in IDEA is that special education teachers must have a bachelor's degree. Now remember, that is not in ESSA. That is only in IDEA which at the time this was going on, I thought, well, that seems like a pretty low bar. However, apparently there are some states who are certifying people without bachelor's degrees, not in special ed, that's clearly a violation of the law. Special ed teacher must have a BA and obtain full state certification as a special education teacher, including alternate routes as defined in NCLB. Let's stop there for a minute. If you'll recall, NCLB said you could be in an alternate route for up to three years with professional development if it was leading to full certification. So that provision still applies in IDEA, however, it does not apply in ESSA. Now the state can do it if they want to, but the feds are not requiring it. So that's a second differentiation. And the other is, or pass the state special ed teacher licensing exam and hold a license to teach in the state as a special ed teacher. So you could have a BA and have passed a test and you're in. The law does not say you have to have a BA in special ed. It says a BA. The two major distinctions between IDEA and ESSA are the requirement of the bachelor's degree and the specifications around the alternate routes. So how are states responding to this? Oklahoma and Arizona are examples of states that have been hit very hard with teacher shortages 
and we're seeing more and more emergency certifications there. Arizona, Illinois, and Minnesota have lowered their licensing standards. In Arizona, local school administrators can now determine teacher certification, so the state has deferred their authority to the local school districts, and they can determine whether or not a teacher is certified. In New York, there's a different rules for charter schools than for other schools. Charter schools have been given the authority to certify their own teachers with less rigorous preparation and the literacy test that's required for all other teachers have been dropped. So these are some examples of what some states are doing in the face of both critical shortages and opportunities to make decisions that they really didn't have before under NCLB. Where are we at the federal level in terms of support and assistance in facing this challenge? The Higher Education Act has been up for reauthorization for several years now. My guess is that'll continue for several more years. But the bill that was introduced in the House eliminated all of those items listed there for higher ed reauthorization, all of which are really critical to supporting students to go into teaching. Teach grants, which are grants, $4,000 a year for teachers to go in to become teachers in high need fields like special ed. There's a lot of problems with implementing that program, but it is there. Loan forgiveness, public service loan forgiveness, loan forgiveness for teachers who have served a certain period of time for high need fields like special ed and then the Teacher Quality Partnership Grants in Title II. All of these are in the Higher Ed Act. They are all available to address what we're talking about with the shortage in teacher quality. Those tools that we have available at the federal level to address this are vulnerable and really need our attention. As far as funding goes, ESSA Title II, every state has these pretty flexible dollars to use, they could use to create new preparation programs, to expand residency programs, to expand alternate route programs. There's a lot of flexibility in Title II to deal with this challenge. Personal preparation under IDEA, we got a $3 million increase in that account this year, which is just wonderful news. It went from 84 to $87 million in terms of investing in high quality preparation for special educators. And then the state personnel development grants under IDEA. These are three sets of funding that can really be used by states to address that. We can't take any of these things for granted, either at the federal or the state level, and our advocacy and involvement and our voice and the contribution of our expertise is really important in these conversations. Jane has already very nicely explained how things came to be that Maine and some other states had problems with teacher certification, and it was the return of to IDEA language that had formerly been superseded by the language in NCLB. I wanted to just quickly share a few points of demographics about our state. We're the 38th nationally in population density. All of those white spaces on the main map on the left of your slide are not organized in any sort of school district. We have 260-ish different school administrative units. We have a little over 2,000 certified special educators and the problem, at least 100 first-year conditionally certified special educators. A lot of schools are using long-term subs, which of course we have concerns about in terms of their preparation and ability to do the work that needs to be done with kids with disabilities. We have three training programs offering a bachelor's degree. We also have three institutions offering special education graduate programs. A lot of the courses are offered online, which helps many people, of course, because it's more accessible. Then we have two post-baccalaureate certification programs at various universities, most are entirely online. When we realized that we were going to have to check no on Assurance 14, I began working with various people in terms of developing a plan. One of the things that we had to take into consideration was language that needed to be changed was in rule, but we had to change statutory language first in order to authorize the changes. So that required me, after we realized what our timeline needed to be, to ask for one year delay in compliance from OSEP, which they were very willing to grant us. But then I immediately began approaching the University of Maine system the shell for what we wanted to do was developed with and through the University of Maine faculty. We had some experience doing this work through a SPDIG grant that we had received a few years ago. One of the things that we needed to do to be in compliance was to move to only two levels of certification. Maine had a complicated certification system where a teacher was provisionally certified for the first three years in the classroom and then moved to professional 
there were transitional, there was conditional, there was waivers, and huge number of different certification types that people had to deal with. Now, there are two types. Either you're professionally certified, which means fully certified, or you're conditionally certified. The rule that we've developed offers more guidance regarding coursework that's required and the number of semester hours. But we also have put in place, in compliance with the federal requirements, that the conditional certification is limited to three years. And during that three-year period now, according to our plan, teachers have to complete coursework that they would have to complete regardless of whether they were in this program or not, pass the praxis for content knowledge and participate in intensive mentoring for the first year of teaching. Just a list of things that we've had to think about as we've worked through this is the intersection of the teacher shortage and the teacher quality. Maine is one of the few states that is subject to the windfall provision in that we have a state retirement system, but it does not talk to people who want to come into the state to teach that might help our teacher shortage, because if they're already in social security or some other system, it doesn't work well in terms of the accumulation of time and benefits. So that's a barrier to teachers coming in other states to help teach. We have had to rely a lot on long-term substitutes, but by state rule, the amount of time that a classroom can have a long-term substitute is limited. And so you have a dilemma of long-term substitutes rotating through a classroom, which is, in my opinion, worse than having a long-term substitute in there for the entire year. Funding has been an issue, as it always is, in many of these initiatives. School districts have used local funds. Teachers have paid for their own courses, unfortunately. And the federal local entitlement funds under IDEA are available to pay for the courses. We've also had to wrestle with the issue of mentor pay, even though our intent is to return the responsibility for this entire process to the local school district because we believe that's where it belongs. But right now, it's a token payment. We've had huge numbers of people volunteer to be mentors, and we only pay them $500 per school year. So there's a lot of interest in the field in terms of supporting our young teachers who need the support in special education classrooms. The course tuition fees that are generated pay for the instructor. The Alternative Certification Mentoring Program is Maine's response to this requirement. It applies to just four certification endorsements in Maine. The Teacher of Children with Disabilities, as contrasted with the Teacher of Severely Impaired Students, there are only two distinctions in the special education certification in Maine. Basically, most people use the 282 certificate. And then we've got Teachers of Visually Impaired and Teachers of the Deaf. And it affects all the employment situations that are listed on the slide. The infrastructure was the next thing that we took on, and what I decided to do was to fund a position at the University of Maine to develop and revise recruit mentors, coordinate the project, develop the infrastructure, and the person that we employed to do that is Valerie Smith. So the program is designed to provide a lot of support during the first year that the conditionally certified teacher is teaching. They take a course, it's entirely online, and right now we're doing a little bit of a redesign. We're finishing the first semester piloting it. We'll have 10 seminars that are live, and the rest of it will be asynchronous work. Each semester, we're asking them to do two observations. Those are formal observations. Our mentors are all veteran teachers who have at least five years experience, and the ones who applied, we started the recruitment process back in February, and had a huge, huge number of people respond to that, which was a very pleasant surprise, I think, for all of us. Other mentors have been coming on as the project has gone along, and those are people who are already trained by the district. We're just orienting them to what we're doing and then using them as mentors. One of the great things in Maine is that within our educator effectiveness part of DOE, there was already a really well-developed mentor training that was right in alignment with what the national standards are. The mentoring is tied to the Maine teaching standards, and this comes from INTAS. During the three years that they have to earn their professional certification, they're documenting that they are meeting those standards and the observations where the documentation is happening. And this also goes into the district's requirements, meeting what they need for their certification and recertification. Mentors may or may not be in the same district with their mentees. Ideally, we put people, if they're in the same district, we know best practices, that's where we want people to be. If not, then we go with people who are out of the district, but maybe teaching in the same population. Developing an initial teacher action plan, they're doing the observations and they're having contact with them at least weekly. And if the mentee gets to the end of the year and still does not seem to be meeting their standards or meeting their goals and their plan, then the subsequent year there's more intensive mentoring and oversight. So the course is for graduate credit. It's two semesters. You can see how we selected the topics. I looked in the research. We did stakeholder groups and we also had a survey. So these are the topics that are being touched on. Pretty much all of the things that first-year teachers really need to know. 
we're not going into these topics in an enormous amount of depth because in the 24 credit hours that they need to take to get that professional certification, they will have coursework on each of these topics. We talk about this course as kind of being the survival skills for your first year of teaching so that hopefully you'll get to the end of the year having a successful experience. Your students will have had a more successful experience. Their projects are all things that are coming out of their classroom. They use one of their students as a case study basically for the whole year and everything that they're using, they're applying with that student and it's all things they would have been doing anyway. So there are no external projects that aren't directly connected to their practice. The intent of this, a long range plan, is to return supervision and the oversight of the mentors back to the district. We want to build capacity across the state. So we're looking at how can we pass the mentoring piece back to the districts, working with districts to ensure that they have those things in place. If they feel like they have some places that need additional work, then we'll be developing plans to work with them. These are our long-term goals. We want people to get their professional certification within that three-year time. We want to increase the statewide capacity to support new special educators, increasing the number and quality of special education mentors that we have. If you think back to that slide where you saw the map of Maine and those big white spots, there are a lot of places that are really under-resourced, so we want to do a lot of work particularly in those regions. Some districts only have one special educator, and they may not have anybody who can step into that role. So we're hoping to have something in the state over the long term where districts can contact the state and say, I need a mentor. Do you have somebody that might be available?